Let's see, question. Um, would you also recommend a microsite or site like less highlight for a new industry given that you're trying to break into? I think that's an excellent question. You cannot create a microsite or sitelet without having content on it. So until you have that content, creating it will be challenging to do. Um, and creating a page that's empty isn't going to do anything and will, will actually do damage to you. So I would say that um, uh, in so much as you have um, you've solidified the offering that you have in that new industry that you're trying to break into, so what services you offer and where you can list relevant case studies or applications of principles or solutions that you found in another industry that's relevant here for the same person might have the same challenge, those are great things to put up there on that page. So as long as you've got something to say, absolutely it makes sense to do. In a big law firm of over a thousand lawyers, how do you control this? I think our fear is that lawyers will post or tweet out of turn and create larger risk management problems. So the solution is not to engage digital media at all beyond websites and emails. Um, I, I, we hear this a lot from our clients. Certainly there's a heightened sensitivity in the legal world to these things. Um, unless you've turned, um, uh, what we're talking about in today's presentation is the business application of social media networks. Whether or not you choose to link to someone's personal Twitter account or follow them um, is a separate question. There are ways in which businesses can use these networks um, that have real um, uh, application and relevance to your prospects or customers. Monitoring them um, is, is the nature of this question, and posting or tweeting out of turn, um, it, it depends if, they've, if they're listed sort of if it's an official law firm uh, Twitter or not. The way, for example, entertainers, celebrities, and politicians have chosen to handle this issue is to create an official Twitter feed, an official Facebook page, and anything else that's not coming from that is not considered uh, official. Now, the legal standing of that remains to be seen. Uh, I do think that folks are still trying to figure out what the liability issues would be, but that's one solution for it. Um, the other thing I would note is that anyone who's got a personal account, so for example, an attorney or an accountant in a firm, may or may not have her, his or her own personal account and is going to tweet about it anyway. So unless you're controlling that, which I doubt very much that you are, it's happening anyway. So it's important to monitor it. What marketers used to tell clients about, I don't know, two, three years ago, uh, was just to monitor and not to play. The landscape has shifted that now you really do need to play. Um, so getting out in front of this, I would say, is important. Um, uh, how you choose to develop that policy is, is, is not something I'm, I'm equipped to, to, to speak to, but I would say that uh, not only do you need to monitor and create your own presence from a business perspective and communicate from that, um, I would be very transparent. The, one of the best parts about the new digital uh, landscape is, is transparency. And I would encourage you to develop a policy in concert with your employees that works for everybody. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. How do you shift the mindset of attorneys to get buy-in for these ideas and campaigns? Um, it's a great question. Um, I would love clarification from folks if you mean for these ideas and campaigns. You mean digital campaigns? Um, should attorneys be looking to market online um, and, sh and why should they engage in the digital space? We spent the bulk of our first webinar talking about how buyers of professional services are already online and using the digital channel to find firms to work for and represent them. So it's not that people are not out there. They're absolutely out there online looking for solutions that you, your firm probably provides. So to ignore it is to like saying, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to be where you're looking. So we can certainly, uh, I encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel and to, to view that presentation and you Force get a sense. all the lawyers to watch <laughs> every one of these. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Force all the lawyers to watch all of our webinars. Uh, there is um, outstanding data to, to support the fact that businesses cannot ignore the, the, the channel and cannot afford not to have a presence and an engaging presence on them. Um, Happy, I would encourage you to email me specifically if you've got questions, um, uh, something more specific than that. Um, let's see, so we have a question via Twitter which asks, Ray, your California firm analogy, any research on perception of firms being seen as digital carpetbaggers? That's a great question. Um, I would say that the quality of your content matters, we have a lot of questions, the quality of your content matters regardless of the channel that you're in. So if you post crap, you're going to get crap back. Uh, so making sure that you put up there information that is relevant, that is about the industry that you're in, that's not about I'm at the Starbucks in the corner or gee, 
wasn't Lady Gaga's outfit wild last night? I mean, that's not relevant. And people will choose to unfollow you or won't find you at all. One of the things that's really important to remember about the digital channel, uh, once it's out there, it stays out there. And I think this speaks to the earlier question that we had about the law firm and liability. Uh, once you've put something out there on Twitter, it doesn't go away. And so uh, you want to monitor and maintain the tweets that you put out there and your blog posts um, carefully and what's up on Facebook. On Facebook, you can actually delete postings. And on your blog, you can certainly, certainly take things down. But on Twitter, you don't have the ability. Um, and so you want to make sure that someone looking at the history of your tweets, of your feed, that they see quality there. So I'd say that link quality, who you choose to retweet, um, and the uh, frequency at which you, the, you put content out there really helps to deal with the carpetbagger um, issues. Um, oh, the other part, part about the carpetbaggers, you know, for someone, so for example, the quality, if you're a Pennsylvania law firm and just mentioning California and someone link, click, clicking through the link lands at your home page and sees that you're primarily a Pennsylvania address, that's not going to be taken well. You want to make sure that you're using an, a landing page strategy where someone lands on a page that is much more tailored to the California issue at hand. All right, when you say 70 80% of your tweets should be retweets, what do you mean by should in order to raise rankings? Um, no, the, the should is actually more of an operating model. It's not, um, it's, it's, uh, it helps you to, when you retweet information, it helps to budget your time a little bit more effectively because um, you don't have to create new content. You're simply passing along information that you think others would find relevant as well. Um, but uh, no, the number of retweets you post does not have anything to do with your rankings. It does, however, have to do with the number of followers. Generally, someone who's out there only post posting information and not following anyone, that's not really following the, sort of the, the etiquette and the protocol of Twitter. Twitter is about sharing information, not just putting your own uh, point of view out there. So it's kind of the, the rules of the road, the, 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 the rules of that particular sandbox. 